Well, good morning. Happy Memorial Day tomorrow. On April the 6th, 1862, in southwest Tennessee, the Union Army, commanded by Major General Louis Ulysses S. Grant, was defeated in a stunning surprise attack by the Confederate Army. That was a dark night for General Grant and the Union Army, but Union reinforcements arrived. So early the next morning on April 7, 1862, the Union Army launched a counterattack and forced the Confederate Army to retreat. This Battle of Shiloh was named for a nearby church. That church has been reconstructed and the battlefield is now a memorial in Tennessee. There was even a postage stamp that was issued in honor of the Battle of Shiloh. And so how many of you can remember when postage was four cents? Raise your hand. Yes, I don't see very many of those because that was back when dinosaurs walked the earth. But uh, both sides suffered heavy losses in the Battle of Shiloh. General Grant's reputation was damaged for many, many years after that. However, the Battle of Shiloh turned out to be an early turning point of the Civil War, and later Grant led the Union Army to victory in the Civil War and became the 18th President of the United States. One of the Union commanders in the Battle of Shiloh was an unbelieving lawyer named General Lew Wallace, who later became a Christian and wrote the second best-selling novel of the 19th century called Ben-Hur, which was made into a spectacular 1959 movie that won 11 Academy Awards. One of the Union commanders in the Battle of Shiloh, or rather both Grant and Wallace, in that battle suffered defeats, but later they achieved victory. In the Old Testament, King David and the army of Israel suffered a terrible defeat in battle only to experience after that a victory. Now last week we studied in 2 Samuel chapter 8 about David's victories in those battles, but today we're going to study Psalm 60 about how God is the only one who can win the victory after defeat. So David first experienced defeat, then he experienced defeat victory and the record of how he prayed to God for that victory is in Psalm chapter 60. You know we all suffer defeats in life, different kind of defeats. So there are valuable lessons for all of us to learn here in Psalm chapter 60. So uh, it's appropriate that we begin once again with prayer. Would you join me? Dear Father in heaven, we praise you that you will win the final victory over all evil through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the meantime, give us your hope to trust you as we wait that final victory. Thank you for the generations of American men and women in uniform who paid the ultimate price to defend and preserve our freedoms. We pray for your comfort and grace for so many that are grieving and suffering at this moment from the war in Ukraine to the sh those who lost loved ones in the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Help us now as we study your word to learn how we can respond to defeat of any kind. And we ask this believing in the victorious name of Jesus. Amen. Last Sunday again, we studied in 2 Samuel 8 how David's army won victories on every compass point around Israel, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. But today in Psalm chapter 60, or Psalm 60, we read David's prayers that surrounded that defeat that ultimately brought victory. So let's look now at Psalm 60. Psalm 60 has the longest superscription, that is the longest introduction of any other psalm. So let's begin with that introduction. For the choir director, according to the Lily of Testimony, a Mick Tom of David for teaching. Now, Psalm 60 is like many other psalms. It has musical notations at the beginning about uh, how it was originally composed and the psalms were either sung or chanted to music. The original music played on those kinds of instruments have been lost. But because the words of the psalms were originally sung, now even in the 21st century we can add any kind of music to it and still sing because these were song tunes. So notice that David composed Psalm 60 for teaching. 
That means that as we study this psalm, we need to learn from it. So let's continue that introduction. When he, David, fought Aram Naharayim, which in Hebrew means Syria of the two rivers, the two rivers referring to Tigris and Euphrates. We'll look at a map. And Aram Zobah, again Hebrew, Syria of Zobah. And Joab, who was David's general, returned and struck Edom in the Valley of Salt, killing 12,000. So let's look at our map again from last week, get my laser pointer. And here is all this region is Aram, our modern day Syria in the north of Israel. Edom is here in the south. The Euphrates River, and then of course going even off screen uh, would be the Tigris also that would go over into uh, Iraq uh, today. So that's the, the map. So um, with that in mind, we remember that these two enemy nations, the Syria in the north, or Aram in the north, Edom in the south, what we think is going on behind the, uh, in the context of this psalm was that David took the troops of Israel to the north, he was fighting uh, there against uh, the ancient uh, Arameans, then Edom does a surprise attack in the south, so David is forced uh, with this defeat from the Edomites in the south to divide the army, send Joab, and as we know of, ultimately, uh, um, Joab had victory, as we're told here. So we don't know the details, but that seems to be the situation that was going on. So Psalm 60 is divided into three stanzas, so let's read the first stanza that takes up the first five verses. So David's addressing God in prayer. God, you have rejected us. You have broken out against us. You have been angry. Restore us. You have shaken the land and split it open. Heal its fissures for its shudders. You have made your people suffer hardship. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. In the first three verses, David is praying and he's using some pretty strong language. But I want you to notice in the blue words that six times David addresses God as you. David had a personal relationship with God, which allowed him even to talk this strongly to God. Now, some people, some Bible students think that David is lashing out at God and he's blaming God for the defeat that the army suffered. But I think if you examine this carefully, what David is saying here, that he's a confessing that somehow Israel had failed, Israel had sinned, and that God is responding according to his covenant in discipline upon the nation. It's possible that this picture of this earthquake here was really with shaking of the land, the fissures, the shuddering. It's possible that was the, these thousands of enemy troops marching and their chariots rolling that actually would have shaken the earth. In verse 3, this wine, this picture of wine given to them to drink, that is a consistent picture through the prophets of God dealing out his judgment, his wrath upon his, on anyone, both his own people and uh, God's enemies. But what is important to notice, look at the blue words. In verse 1, David prays, restore us. In verse uh, 2, he prays uh, to heal Basically, David is confessing the sin of the people here and asking God to forgive them. You know, whenever we suffer a defeat in life, we need to think about our actions. We need to search our hearts. We need to examine our words to be sure that we are not guilty of some sin, that the defeat that we're experiencing is the consequence of that sin. If that's the case, if we have sin, then we need to confess it. Ask God to forgive us and be restored to fellowship. But our sin is not always the cause of defeats, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Then going on to verse 4, David prays, You, God, have given a signal flag to those who fear you, so that they can flee before the archers. And then the pause, Selah. David calls out in faith for God to deliver the people from these enemies. And when David prays that God has given those who fear him a signal flag. David isn't talking about some banner that is stuck up by the army that all the troops could, could look at. David is referring to the signal flag, the banner here, as the Lord himself because 
the banner, the flag, that's one of God's great names in the Old Testament. Look at Exodus 17, verse 15. And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. In Hebrew, it's Jehovah or Yahweh Nisi. If you remember the story there, Israel was fighting the Amalekites. Joshua won a victory because Aaron on one side, her on the other, held Moses' hands up as a symbol that God was with them. And after that great victory, Moses commemorated the victory by building this altar, and he names it after one of God's great names, the Lord is my banner. Or you could translate it, the Lord is my flag. One of the costliest battles in the loss of our American soldiers in World War II was the five-week <clears throat> Battle of Iwo Jima in the Pacific from February to March of 1945. Now, my dad was named William, and he was wounded twice on Iwo Jima, and he won the Purple Heart. He was wounded by the Japanese, then they sent him to Hawaii, patched him up, sent him right back to the battlefield, and he was wounded a second time. So my dad won the Purple Heart, and there's what one looks like. A few years ago, of course my dad died many years ago, um, I gave my dad's Purple Heart to my stepsister's grandson, who's also named William, so that when baby William grows up, he will remember the sacrifice that my dad made and all of the soldiers, not just in World War II, but all of the soldiers throughout American history. And that's what we are to commemorate tomorrow, not just a day off, not just uh, another day on the calendar, but to remember the sacrifice that those men made. Now, the costly American victory has forever been immortalized in the Pulitzer Prize winning photo of six Marines raising the American flag on Iwo Jima. And then this photograph was later turned into the U.S. Marine Corps War Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. But what I wanted, the reason I have for telling you this story is that in Psalm 60 verse 4, the Lord himself is our flag. He is our banner. He is our hope. So the next time you experience defeat in your life, think about the Lord. Not a flag, but the Lord himself is the one who is waving in the wind to give us that hope that we need when we experience defeat. Then in verse 5, David prays, Save with your right hand and answer me so that those you love may be rescued. Again, in the middle of defeat, David is calling out to God to save them, to rescue them, because God loves them. Fellow believer, when you experience defeat, don't be bashful. Call out to God to prayer, uh, in prayer. He loves you. He will answer. And we'll talk about the timing of the answer in a bit. But God does answer David's prayer here in Psalm 60, and that's the second stanza of this great little psalm beginning in verses 6 to 8 the second stanza let's read it God has spoken in his sanctuary now here's God talking I will triumph I will divide up Shechem I will apportion the valley of Succoth Gilead is mine Manasseh is mine and Ephraim is my helmet Judah is my scepter Moab is my wash basin I throw my sandal on Edom. I shout in triumph over Philistia. Now, I want us to look at a map to see where all these locations are again. But what God is saying is here, he is the rightful owner of both the land of Israel and all these compass points beyond. So let's look at this, um, this map. So first of all, Shechem is on the west side of the Jordan River. The Valley of Succoth is on the east side of the Jordan River. Gilead and Manasseh on the east side, and then Ephraim and Judah on the west side of the Jordan. And of course, Edom and Moab here in the south, and the Philist Philistia are the Philistines on the west coast there of Israel. So that gives you where these are on the map. Now, just think with me. If God is the rightful owner of all these lands, isn't he able to take care of what belongs to him? The same thing is true today. God owns everything. You and I don't own anything. We are only the tenants. We're only the renters. 
We're only the stewards of everything that God has given us, and that means we're responsible to him for what we do with everything that we have. But notice back in these verses, God is saying that it's not the might, uh, the mighty army of Ephraim or Judah that is going to win this battle. God himself is the warrior. Ephraim, in verse 7, Ephraim is God's helmet. God's the fighter. Judah is God's scepter. God is the true king of Israel, not David. And it's God's reputation that is at stake. So, brother, sister in Christ, the next time you feel defeated, whether it's your fault or not, let God fight the battle for you so that he can get the glory. Now, those of you who are in our prayer text ministry, remember that, uh, which is led by the Gablis family here, that uh, you remember that I sent out an urgent request asking you to pray that God would help me in a potentially uh, big misunderstandings with one of my neighbors who is not a Christian. Well, and it could have turned into a very ugly legal fight, but within two hours of that text going out and you praying, the dispute was resolved without any kind of struggle. Prayer works. So when we are defeated, when we're facing potential defeat, we simply need to pray. Now, what about Israel's enemies, these last three, Moab, Edom, Philistia? Well, here, God has a great sense of humor. This is what is called satire. The picture in verse 8 is God is this big, bad soldier, the biggest and the baddest soldier. He comes in from battle. He washes himself, and what does he do with the water that he washed? He dumps it on Moab, and he kicks off his supersized sandals, and where does he fling them? On Edom. I don't know what you like to do when you get home, but I like to get home. I like to take off my shoes, take off my socks, and go around barefoot or walk in my flip-flops. But sometimes I like to just fling those flip-flops away. I don't know if you like to do that or not. But that's what God's doing. He just flips his sandals on Edom. And then finally, the Philistines were known for their war cries, for their shouts. Remember against Samson when he was in the temple of Dagon or against the Israelites when David was fighting Goliath. The Philistines were famous, were famous for their shouts of triumph. Here, what does God say? I'm shouting in triumph over Philistia. Let me ask you a question. What does God think about all these mighty modern nations who are so arrogant as they rebel against God, as they ridicule Jesus? Well, Psalm 2 Verses 4 and 5 tells us, The one enthroned in heaven, God the Father, laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger, and he terrifies them in his wrath. So the next time that you feel anxious or worried about the Russian war or the Chinese threats, or even when you feel the, the anxiety over the anarchists, the terrorists, the traitors in our own country at every level, Remember God's reaction to them. God is roaring with laughter in heaven because he knows their day of defeat is coming soon when Jesus returns in the sky to conquer this planet and rule for a thousand years. And believer, do not fool yourself. The United States of America will not submit to Jesus Christ when he returns, if we even exist. I believe first we're going to be conquered by antichrist forces before the Lord Jesus returns. And if you haven't been keeping up, this is happening right before our eyes. But we don't need to worry because who is in control? Who is our defender? Who is our fighter? So after God answers David's prayer in Psalm 60, remember that David is still in the midst of this defeat in battle. He's still in dire straits. The Edomites have attacked in the south. So the third and final stanza of Psalm 60, David is again praying and calling on God to save them from the enemy. So verse 9, third stanza, David says, Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Remember again from the superscription, that introduction, we know that David sent General Joab south to fight the Edomites, and they won in an overwhelming victory. But before that battle... This is David calling out in prayer in verse 9 to the only one who's going to be able to win against Edom. Why? Notice verse 9 how specific David is. He says, the fortified city of Edom. 
that can only refer to one city in Edom that was virtually impregnable. That one city is called Petra. It was carved out of sandstone and it was hidden deep in the mountains. Many years ago, I had the privilege to visit Petra once, which is in the modern country of Jordan. The only entrance to this uh, city is a long, narrow gorge. And here you can see just this uh, horse-drawn cart coming through this when you see this great treasury monument, one of the most beautiful of all the buildings in that city. But you could imagine soldiers would have to maybe go single file or two abreast down two miles of this long ravine with cliffs of thousand feet high. So it, the city was virtually impregnable. I didn't walk that two miles, I rode a horse there. But uh, think about armies trying to attack the city. So only God could give victory over this unassailable fortress, and God did that. And many Bible students think that during the seven years of tribulation, the Jews who will be persecuted by the Antichrist will hide out and take refuge in Petra. Those of you who saw the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade with Harrison Ford and Sean Connery about the quest for the Holy Grail, the exteriors for that sequence were filmed there at Petra. The interiors of that movie were uh, filmed in London. But again, David prays because he seems to have composed this psalm before uh, Edom's, the victory over Edom. So let's pick up in verse 10. God, haven't you rejected us? He's back to that theme again. God, you do not march out with our enemy or with our armies. Give us aid against the foe, for human help is worthless. Once again, David is confessing his own, his army's helplessness against the enemy. Again, David's not blaming God. David's focusing on their need for God's aid against the foe. But notice verse 11 here. This is a very profound thought that we all need to remember. Human help is worthless. Now, when we talk about human help, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help our neighbors fix their flat or take out the trash or feed their pet or bake a pie for them. But it does mean that no human being can ever come to our aid in the big things of life. Only the Lord can help us. And so David concludes this very, what I would call a neglected little psalm, with a final punchline that we must not forget. Verse 12, the last verse of the psalm, with God we will perform valiantly. He will trample our foes. Notice how David words this. He doesn't say, with our might we're going to win. It's with God we will perform valiantly. David does not say, we're going to lick them, we're going to stick it to them. David says, he will trample our foes. What can we learn about praying for victory in the midst of defeat? From this psalm, two little lessons. Only God can give us victory. And like David, we must ask for that victory. Paul tells us clearly in the New Testament who our enemies are. We don't have Moab, we don't have Edom, but here are our enemies. Ephesians 6, beginning verse 12. For our battle is not against flesh and blood. People are not our enemies. But our enemies are against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. If you thought David had impossible odds against the implacable foes of Moab and Edom, they were child's play versus the demons that we face. And I sincerely believe that demons are taking over America and over the world in preparation for that seven years of tribulation that precedes the second coming of Christ. But even if the demons are all around us, we don't need to fear because who is the one that can protect us? who is the only one who can protect us. Read Psalm 60. Now, I said earlier that sometimes our defeats are our fault, but that's not always the case. Many times our defeats are not our fault. Think about the Old Testament. Think of Job. Think of Joseph. Think of Jesus himself who suffered when they were not to blame. The same is true of us many times in our lives. We suffer innocently, not for anything we've done. And when we ask God for the victory, Sometimes he gives us the victory soon, like my answered prayer within two hours. 
Other times, we may, may have to wait for years for God to answer our prayer. But many times, we may not see the answer to our prayer for deliverance in our lifetime. But we must not lose hope. God's victory will come. Because the all-victorious God is our God. Robert Louis Stevenson was a 19th century Scottish novelist, most famous for writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Stevenson was a man's man. And although he was a man of the world and not a Christian, Stevenson admired Christian Scottish missionary James Chalmers. And one of the reasons that Stevenson admired James here was because he was also a man's man. Now, James sailed to New Guinea, what is now called Papua New Guinea, or PNG, north of Australia, to the east of Indonesia. And, he, and James went there to win cannibals to Christ. Now, James and his band of missionaries made contact with the cannibals in the jungle for the first time on Easter Sunday, 1901. But before any word of the gospel was preached, before any text of the Bible was explained, those savages killed James and his fellow uh, missionaries. They cooked them and they ate them. That news shocked England back home. James' mission with the gospel to Papua New Guinea went down in death and defeat. It seemed that the enemy had triumphed. But 70 years later, during the great revivals in Papua New Guinea, mighty miracles like the book of Acts occurred to convince those nationals of the existence and the supreme power of the one true God. I got to hear those stories a number of years ago when I visited PNG to preach and to teach the Bible. But do you know what the greatest of all the miracles were that happened? Were the conversions, the sanctifications of those savages. Here is a Christian family in Papua New Guinea today. In those great revivals, over 3,000 men and women who had been former cannibals were won to Christ. Where once the people were naked, covered with war paint, after their conversions they sat with reverence in their right minds, partaking of the cup and the bread at the Lord's Supper. 120 mission uh, stations were established throughout the jungles on those volcanic covered mountains and over 60 men bearing the tattoos on their bodies marked marking them as warriors because they had killed and eaten their enemies those same 60 men became dedicated evangelists pastors and teachers of the gospel and God's word and I had the privilege to teach their sons and their grandsons in PH in PNG only the one true God the all-powerful God in heaven could win such a stupendous victory after such a horrible defeat when his own missionaries were killed and eaten. And that same God is the one who fights for us. Let's pray. Father, I ask that whatever battle someone is facing here today, whatever defeat they've suffered, Father, I ask that you would show yourself to be the strong God, the all-powerful God in their lives. Give them your victory in your time for your glory. And I ask this in Christ's victorious name. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful holiday tomorrow and safety this week.